Okay, I think it's time to start. So welcome to this giant webinar on one-click access to students, teachers and researchers in the age of GDPR. I'm Mikael Linden from the Finnish NREN, which is CSC, the ID Center for Science. And I've been working on this data protection issues in federations, including the Chean Data Protection Code of Conduct for a long time. So the contents of this webinar are here. I'll first shortly introduce you Chean, and then the secure login with home organization credentials, which is the approach that Chiant is, is um, promoting for access to online services. And then I'll focus on the Chiant Data Protection Code of Conduct, which is the um, focus of the rest of the webinar. I'll provide some details on the Code of Conduct, from the end user or data subject perspective and also describe the data subject rights which are relevant for for you as as potential end users and finally i'll provide you an opportunity to provide feedback on on the code of conduct approach so first what is chant i would say chant is three things Chant is an association of national research and education networks. Well, all European countries have one, and, and there are also entrants beyond Europe. So Chant is the kind of umbrella organization for them. But Chant is also a project, or actually several projects, that the European Commission is funding on the Horizon 2020. And the third thing is that Chiant is the network, the internet, academic internet backbone in Europe, and also associated services like Edurome and Edugain that I will soon introduce. There are several national um, representatives of this Chiant network. This is a kind of collection of those logos of, of the NREN organizations. They together connect over 10,000 institutions in, in Europe and 50 million academic end users. And in practice, they cover all European Union countries and, and also some other European countries in this map. So that was a short introduction of Chiant and one of the work areas of Chiant is secure login with home organization credentials. What does that mean? The idea is that the end user who is a student or teacher or researcher in, in one, of, one of the universities or research institutions in the Chiant constituency, they would have just one username and password that their home organization provides them. And then they can use those credentials to access services they need for their, well, well, for their life as a student, teacher or researcher. Those services are potentially provided by other organizations, sometimes even other countries or con continents. Those services may be related to e-learning like learning management systems and other tools to support e-learning, collaboration tools like wikis and, and other, other collaboration platforms, library services like electronic journals and other licensed contents that, that the university libraries provide to the, to the users, administration services in the universities, and last but not least, services related to research. So in Europe, there are more than 50 research infrastructures which support the cross-institutional collaboration of researchers coming from different universities and research institutions. And those infrastructures 
provide services like access to data or or instruments for the researchers in in the discipline what is not necessarily so obvious for for you as the end users is that the connection between the home organization and the service provider or sp is actually managed by identity federations what what we call identity federations it's an NREN operated service that brings the connection and enables the end users to use the single set of credentials to access services if the services are in different country than the home organization of the researcher edugain comes to the game edugain is an interconnection of of the national identity federations and this is the map of of edugain at the moment so almost all european and northern american countries are connected to edugain and and also several other countries in the world i think the number of connected federations is is about 70 at the moment so this is how it works and this diagram also um, illustrates the challenge why we have the code of conduct that i that i will soon introduce we have here the user they are a researcher in the home organization and the home organization manages a server that we call an identity provider or idp and the user when the user wants to access a service managed by another organization the user first presents the username and password or other means of authentication to the home organization's identity provider server and then the identity provider ser server releases or is supposed to release attributes to the service provider in in another organization the attributes are normally not too invasive typically they are the user's name email address unique identifier which which doesn't change if the user's name or email address changes role and affiliation such as if the person is a student in in their home university or research or something else sometimes also some more dedicated attributes to describe the users permissions in the service however too often the end user faces difficulties in this what we call federated login but it turns out that the home organization of the user is not willing to release the attributes these attributes to the service provider organization because the home organization believes that the privacy privacy laws do not allow them to share the attributes with another organization and the result for the end user is that he or she can do their job if if they are a researcher or, or access the study related services if, if they are a student which makes them unhappy and this is where and why we have developed this code of conduct just some um, observations of this setup we in Cheon believe that this approach is actually quite good for information security and privacy um, username and password remains something that is between the user and the home organization it's never shared with the service provider and it's also possible to make sure that only relevant attributes of the user are shared with the service provider organization and it is also believed that the attributes that the identity provider in the user's home organization manages are quite fresh and accurate because normally the user has strong connection with the home organization and the home organization is in a position to keep the attributes fresh 
and only at the time of login they are shared with the service provider organization. So this is basically the um, challenge that the Gian Data Protection Code of Conduct tries to solve. So I'm next going to the Gian Data Protection Code of Conduct principles. So here is a diagram how the Gian Data Protection Code of Conduct um, sits between the home organization of the user and the service provider. So the idea is that Gian Project has collected relevant practices that are useful in the context of federated identity management. Practices which make sense to implement GDPR for the service providers. And those good practices are collected to the document. And the idea is that the service provider commits to the code of conduct. And then the federations record the service provider's commitment and relay it to the home organizations. And we believe that the home organizations feel more confident to release attributes to those service providers who have committed to the code of conduct. Um, what I'm describing here is the second version of the Giant Code of Conduct. We have been working on it since the approval of GDPR three years ago. And we now have a stable draft that we will present to the authorities. We have also a previous version of the Code of Conduct prepared six years ago. And it's a good practice that is currently um, that currently around 200 service providers have committed to and more than 300 home organizations recognize. So what is a code of conduct? Well, it's a GDPR concept. It's, it's introduced there in Article 40 and 41 of GDPR. Um, it's the GDPR idea of community self-regulation that Gian community as a representative of identity federations in the European academic world has pulled together good practices for privacy and GDPR interpretation in the context of the federations. And the idea is that when the code developer brings the code of conduct to the data protection authorities, um, the approval by the authorities gives extra powers to the code of conduct. And GDPR uh, in particular introduces three items that an approved code of conduct gives. So it can be used by the service providers to demonstrate their compliance with the GDPR. And it can be taken into account when the service provider does its data protection impact assessment. And last but not least, it can be also a legal grounds for transferring the attributes to third countries which is another challenge in the context of academic federations because cross-continental and cross-Atlantic research is some use case in, in identity federations as well, but release of personal data out of European Union is sometimes tricky. So this is what, what codes of conduct and, and the GEAN data protection code of conduct is for. And next, I'll go to the details of the Cheyenne Data Protection Code of Conduct, um, especially from end users' perspective. So the idea is that Cheyenne Coco can become a kind of global framework for, for data protection in, in the context of academic research and education federations. Service providers in European Union and, and European economic area can commit to it, but also service providers in those countries which provide adequate data protection. So so-called white list of, of, of countries that the European Commission manages. <clears throat> 
countries like Switzerland. And then also other countries um, can commit to the code of conduct if it's approved together with binding and enforceable commitments. So for instance, service providers in the, in the United States or Australia. And this is a list of contribution of the code of conduct from an end user perspective. So how this code of conduct influences the life of a student, teacher or researcher when they want to access cross organizational services. So the code of conduct uh, defines the permitted use of, of attributes that the home organization releases to service providers. It also defines an approach for data minimization, transparency or informing the end user on, on the release of, of the personal data. It takes a position to under which conditions a service provider can further release the attributes to a third party in potentially in a third country. It defines approach to data retention and security practices and incident management. And next I'll go through these um, details. So the code of conduct defines that when a service provider commits to the code of conduct, it must use the attributes that the home organization releases only for enabling end users access the service. So other purposes are not permitted unless the user gives the prior consent. And also it requires that the service provider requests only those attributes that contribute to data minimization. So attributes that are adequate, relevant, and not excessive for enabling access to the service. Here on the right hand side, we have some examples that the code of conduct proposes for, for interpretation of enabling access. So it means authorization or validating the user's permission to use the service. For instance, if it's important for the use of the service to know that the end user is a student or a researcher in, in a particular home organization, that in, then that information can be released to manage the user's authorization to access the service. If it's important that the end user is identified um, in the service, for instance, to keep their files or data sets or permissions or pages separate from those of the other end users, then the identifier of the user can be released. If the user community of a service exists also outside the online world, so if the end users know one another in real life, then the person's name is relevant for the collaboration to exist online and then, then the, the person's name can be released for the collaboration tool that the community is using. In the research world, it is important to properly collect, connect the researcher to the scientific contribution. So, that means releasing a researcher identifier is enabling access to a service where, where that, that distinction is, makes, makes a difference. Accounting and billing is enabling access, for instance, if the researcher is using cloud capacity in an academic cloud and they have a certain amount of CPU hours or whatever CPU units, the cloud is using so releasing uh, and using the attributes for enabling access to accounting is enabling access and finally managing information security for instance incident response is is also enabling users to access the services so this is how the 
purpose of processing and data minimization is approached in the code of conduct. Then transparency or informing the end user on processing of the attributes. Well, GDPR introduces the concept of a privacy notice and we make heavy use of it. Um, we provide a template in the Cheon code of conduct that the service providers can use to describe and fulfill their obligation to inform the end users. And Cheon code of conduct also proposes that the home organization presents the link to the privacy notice um, before the end user logs in to the service. So for instance, at the time when the home organization's identity provider server has authenticated the user, but before it releases any attributes to the service, it is suggested that the link to the service provider's privacy policy is presented to the user and the user must be able to read the privacy notice before they actually log into the service and any attribute release takes place. One of the questions is that, is the service provider permitted to release the attributes to a third party, to another service provider or another organization? And it is possible under three conditions. First alternative is that the third party is a data processor for the service provider. So the third party is a subcontractor and has a data processing agreement with the service provider, which is quite usual. Um, the second alternative is what is described here in the diagram. Um, it's actually quite common that many kind of research collaborations have shared the internal responsibility so that one organization manages kind of front-end service that uses home organizations to authenticate the user and then potentially decorates the user with some extra attributes that are relevant in the collaboration and releases them to other services within the collaboration. That's, for instance, how we can see many research infrastructures to organize themselves. And we call this an IDPSP proxy setup. It is possible that this kind of service provider commits to the code of conduct as well and further releases the attributes to third or second service provider, but then also the second service provider needs to um, commit to the code of conduct. So that's the second ballot. Also the third party is committed to the COCO. And the third alternative is that the user consents to the transfer, which is also possible, although consent has some limitations such as it needs to be freely given. And sometimes it is questioned if consent is really freely given if, if a researcher needs to give their consent to do their job or a student to give their consent to be able to take courses. If the service provider is in a third country, so outside European Union, European Economic Area and countries with in the EC whitelist, it is possible to transfer the attributes only if the receiving organization is committed to, to, to the approved code of conduct or some other appropriate measures are in place, like the model contracts that the European Commission has published or, or um, privacy shield if, if the service provider is a commercial company in the US or, or consent by the end user. Data retention is covered by the code of conduct as well. So GDPR says that the 
personal data must be deleted or anonymized when they are no more needed which in the context of federated login means that when the user no more wishes to access the service. However, users seldom tell to the service provider that I no more want to access the service. Instead, the users does, just don't show up again in the service. So that's why the code of conduct proposes an approach that if the user hasn't logged in for 18 months to the service, then the service decides that, okay, it appears the user has stopped using the service and the, the attributes must be deleted from the service provider. However, we have also understood that there are several exceptions here. There may be valid reasons for the service provider to keep the attributes even longer. For instance, researchers must be attributed for their scientific contribution. I believe that's even written to the um, Declaration of Human Rights by the UN, um, that researchers' name or identifier must sit next to their contribution. And that's also necessary for assessing the provenance of a contribution a researcher has done, even although they haven't logged into the service for 18 months. And also other circumstances like the person is maintaining source code in Git and, and needs to update them, make security partition and so on. Then the information security practices. Um, GDPR imposes an obligation to a service provider to properly take care of, of confidentiality and integrity and availability of a service. And the code of conduct's contribution is that it proposes this most widely known security practice in the identity federations community called certifying as the approach for the service providers to um, fulfill their obligation to keep the service secure. And if there is a security breach, uh, well, normal GDPR obligations about informing the end user and, and the authorities apply, but the extra bit that the code of conduct introduces it that the service provider must report um, security breaches also the home organization that the user has used for login. For instance, if it appears that a user account that a user has gone wild, is doing something nasty in the service provider, then it's possible that the user's account in the IDP of the home organization is has gone out of control. The password has been exposed and it's important to tell the home org organization to disable that account. Finally, what you as an end user can do if you think a service provider is misbehaving and not following the code of conduct that they have committed to. Well, the first step is obviously to conduct a service provider and ask them to check if they have a problem and, and correct it. Um, you can also conduct the home federation, the home identity federation of the service provider. It may have some additional measures to check if the home, if the service provider is misbehaving and, and influence on it. The Cheon Data Protection Code of Conduct introduces also a monitoring body that is mandatory for approved codes of conduct. And that monitoring body can be conducted by end users. And finally, there's always the possibility to lodge a complaint with a competent supervisory authority um, on, on the behavior of the, of the service provider. So that was um, 
an overview of the code of conduct from the end user's perspective. And finally, I'll, I want to highlight the, how the code of conduct um, covers the data subject's rights. So for the data subject rights, the code of conduct relies very much on the privacy notice template, the privacy notice for which the code of conduct introduces a template for the service providers. So the service providers describe their privacy related practices in the privacy notice and the home organizations are then encouraged to present the link to the privacy notice to the user at the time when they log in. Of course, the home organizations have also their privacy notices under GDPR. Um, well, they are not covered by the code of conduct because the code of conduct is for service providers mainly. And the data subject rights like how to access or rectify the personal data are described there in the privacy notice. But the principle is that for those attributes that the home organization manages for the end users, the end users are expected to conduct their home organization. And for those extra pieces of personal data that the service provider manages, the end user can conduct the service provider as the data controller of, of the service. So we are nearly in the end of the, co of the webinar. I have introduced you the approach, the federated approach for accessing services and how the giant code of conduct contributes to them. Finally, here is a link to the latest version of the code of conduct. It's front pages here. And this is now an opportunity for you if you want to make, if you have any views or questions for clarification on the code of conduct, please present them to the uh, here is the email address of, of Giant Association. Please present them by email no later than on 17th January. So um, you have now one month opportunity to provide your feedback and views on the code of conduct if you want. <laughs>